Distinguished guests, good afternoon and welcome to the session today, the global effort to end HIV and AIDS, addressing inequalities in the AIDS response to make the money work. My name is Paul Zubau, very briefly, I'm from the Federal Ministry of Health and uh, I'm honored to welcome you today uh, the, together with the World Health Organization Summit 2022 organized, that we organized for the first time jointly. The German Ministry of Federal Health is a long-standing partner of the World Health Summit and a strong supporter to this forum, promoting collaboration and an open dialogue. So the aim of today's discussion is to highlight on the one hand the successes, but also to indicate the challenges in addressing inequalities uh, in the global AIDS response. We will focus therefore on key populations and groups that are left behind and we'll hear from our distinguished speakers all around here today to further illustrate about their experiences at national and at the re regional level. We will also further illustrate the role of international actors with a particular focus on UNAIDS and its crucial role as a catalyst and a con connector throughout the global AIDS response. As a strong advocate for global health, the German government has developed a national global health strategy, which was launched in October back in 2020. It focuses on multilateral action political leadership, innovate, innovative approaches, but also on cooperation at all levels to address the current global health challenges that lie ahead of us. One of the strategy's key priorities is to further strengthen the global health architecture with a strong World Health Organization, obviously at its core. Within the area of HIV and AIDS, it is equally important to build on the strengths of the different actors and make sure that civil society space is not shrinking and not left out. So our commitment to the global fight against HIV is demonstrated not only by our annual contributions to UNH, which made Germany one of the top donors to UNH. It's also underpinned that Germany will take further responsibility by chairing the UNH program coordinating PCB board next year. But let me not waste too much time and let me now introduce uh, our chair and moderator of today's important session, Professor Kenneth Nguyen, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health at Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in Kenya. His task today will be to guide us through this packed session and hopefully fuel candid and critical discussions. We hope we will enable dialogue and interaction through integrating our on-site as well as our remote audience. Professor Nguyen, we are honored to have you here today, and I hand over to you now, and I wish the audience in the room and those who participate online a fruitful and exciting 90 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction. Uh, guten Tag, Habari, Bonjour, Hora. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've, I've tried to catch as many as I can. Welcome to this session titled The Global Effort to Aid HIV and AIDS, Addressing Inequalities in AIDS Response to Make the Money Work. This session highlights the successes and challenges in addressing inequalities in global response. Uh, through a panel of discussion, leaders from different sectors of the response will share first-hand experience on creating and enabling environments for HIV program, tackling policy and program obstacles, as well as amplifying voices of those living with with and affected by HIV, key and vulnerable population and civil and community organizations to ensure a meaningful engagement in the community led responses and monitoring. I will now take a few minutes to introduce our excellent panelists here, who many of you know very well, uh, starting with um, Winnie uh, Bayanima, the executive director. Winnie is the executive director of UNAIDS and an undersecretary general of the United Nations, a passionate and long-standing champion of social justice and gender equality. Uh, Ms. Biamina uh, leads the United Nations efforts to end AIDS epidemic by 2030 and believes in healthcare is a human right and has been an early champion of a people's vaccine against coronavirus that is available free of charge for everyone everywhere. Welcome. And uh, the next uh, panelist I'm going to introduce is Alexe Rahop, of an, an international consultant of the communications and advocacy and fundraising. And Alexe 
has more than 15 years of work experience in the area of HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, substance use prevention, and access to treatment, as well as harm reduction. Um, the next panelist I'm going to introduce is Dr. Ruth Raybon Masha, the CEO of National uh, AIDS Control Council of Kenya. Dr. Masha has a wide ranging experience in HIV, human rights, gender, and sexual reproductive health gained from her 20 year practice as a public health expert in various national and regional and global capacity. Before her appointment, she served Kenya and the Geneva offices of the United Nations Joint Program for HIV AIDS, Action Aid and Gender Health and Family Health Options Kenya. Uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ruth. And then now move on to introduce Dr. John Nekangason, the US Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy, US Department of States, United States of America. Dr. John Kadson is a ambassador at Raj and serves the US Department of State's US Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Health Diplomacy. In this role, uh, Dr. Nkangason oversees the US uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS relief, PEPFAR, which is the largest commitment in a nation to address a single disease in history, prevent millions of HIV infections, save lives, and make progress. Uh, and, and again, we would want to echo yesterday and congratulate uh, Dr. John Kangason for the Visual Prize for Global Health. Thank you. I uh, will now move on to introduce our virtual panelist. Her name is Joyce Ouma, a Youth Council Observer, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Uh, Joyce will serve as an observer on the council and a link with the community's delegation of Global Fund Board. Joyce is a 23-year-old woman living openly with HIV in Kenya. She's passionate about meaningful involvement of adolescents and young people. I don't know how uh, good to see you. And you can wave if you can see us, nice. Then we are now going to, to introduce Diane Stewart. Diane is a Deputy Director, External Relations and Communications Division of Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria in Switzerland. Diane rejoined the Global Fund in October 2017 and serves as the Deputy Director of External Relations and Communications Division. Uh, division. She leads the Donor Relations Department and coordinates the Global Fund's replenishment which raised over $14 billion in 2019 and the organization's engagement to G7 and G20 processes. And then we'll introduce our last panelist, uh, Peter Wesner. Uh, Peter uh, is, an ad is an advocate and public relations officer, actions against AIDS in Germany. Uh, Peter has a diploma in social science and, a social, and social work and is a long-term community and LGBTI activist. He works with as advocacy and communication officer for Action Against AIDS in Germany, a German network working with the global health financing to access universal healthcare. So thank you for that. I will now move on to show our brief video and uh, probably that could go live now. UNAIDS is coordinating the global effort to end AIDS by 2030, bringing together UN agencies, working with people, communities, governments, to make sure everyone has the same opportunities to be healthy and prepared, fighting for human rights, equality and dignity, championing respect, involving everyone in all their diversity. Children, adolescents, women and girls, people living with HIV, gay men and men who have sex with men, people who use drugs, prisoners, sex workers, transgender people, people with disabilities, all who have been marginalized, all wanting to make a difference. UNAIDS is providing data that guides the AIDS response and leveraging resources for it. Supporting providers to deliver services based on needs. 
at the right place, at the right time. That is why we need your support. UNAIDS, uniting the world for zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination, and zero AIDS-related deaths. Thank you for that video. I hope it has set the pace for this afternoon on the items we are going to cover. I'll now invite Dr. Ruth Raibon Masha to respond to an item. So uh, over the past few years, Kenya has made tremendous progress towards its goal to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Since 2010, Kenya has managed to reduce its new infections by 53% and its AIDS-related deaths by 60%. I now want to invite you, Ruth, to comment on what role did UNAIDS and its co-sponsors play in the national AIDS response, especially in the critical areas such as human rights, gender equality, and SRHR. What are the key challenges you are currently facing and what kind of support is needed to overcome these challenges? Thank you very much. Um, I must admit, this was my professor. So I, <laughs> I have to try to do my best. He may probably continue marking the exam. So um, I, 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 I think uh, one of the key things I want to highlight is basically um, um, what UNAIDS has done in the country, but also just to speak about the AIDS response itself and what it means to all of us. So um, the AIDS response, you must agree, has been one of the response that has shown us that we need cooperation of us, government, individuals, as well as societies at large. And for this cooperation to happen, people must come together. And one of the things that we've learned from the response is that without anyone at the global level bringing all these actors together, then we would have no response at all. So in Kenya, we have actually seen the role UNIS has played one, especially in bringing forth policies and strategies that are targeted. Um, Kenya was among the first countries to um, start the concept of location and populations. And a lot of times you've hosted quite a number of nations that have similar setup with us where uh, we have criminalized law and yet we've been able to provide services to groups that are in conflict with the law. And that is where our UNIS comes in. As a honest broker, these populations would not have been a program for if there was no one to begin the dialogue and say, this is the evidence, these are the challenges you have in the country. So as early as 2008, when UNAIDS provided support to the country to actually begin to say where are your new infections coming from, and a lot of them are coming from key populations, the country began a public health approach to programming. But UNAIDS didn't stop there. There was a whole effort to bring communities at the table. And that is where the success probably began because it was easy to program without communities, but communities sitting on the technical groups and beginning to share their personalized experiences for us to use that data that is usually neglected and shape our programs was really, really key. The other element I must admit that as a country that we must really um, uh, uh, examine how our success has been contributed by UN and the consponsors is the area of global fund itself, making the money work. In Kenya, UN is invested very heavily in making the coordination and the technical pieces that are required for the global fund uh, to bring together, um, harmonized and also bring together people that can actually start beginning to design investment cases that, that uh, have been very instrumental in shaping the response. I, I want to just uh, probably just mention one thing again around Global Fund and its relationship with UNAIDS. And then I also move to PEFA. It's always assumed that money can work, but it's almost like thinking that you have a bus, you have the wheels, and then you have the fuel, and then you just imagine it can go. It can go any direction if there's no driver. So UNAIDS has actually been playing that critical role of helping countries and supporting countries to, as a pathfinder. And one of the areas that has been very, very critical uh, for UNAIDS is bringing countries to develop those strategic frameworks that make sense. 
And then when you have the global fund money, for example, PEFA money, then you're able to actually invest in a manner that begins to make sense to the funder, but also makes sense to the people who are receiving the attention that you need. So basically, I think for us, the challenge now remains, we have to admit that there has been a shift as a global architecture. COVID-19 has come. The way we are organized, global north and global south may never be the same again. And therefore we have less money. But we have less money when we need UNAIDS and we need leadership more than ever. We have less money when you have to transition funding streams to local resources. And what happens when, when you go to domestic resources, the most likely thing that's going to happen is that you're going to push people further to their inequality buds. Countries are going to struggle to put a treatment on the table. And therefore, some of the things that you've been doing, bringing communities, trying to address rights, may easily be traded off for the life-saving commodities such as treatment. So we need a stronger UNAIDS more than ever so that as we transition the funding streams, there is a mirror, there's a reflection to tell us who are we leaving behind. Is it possible that government shall say, for example, we do not need to program for people in conflict with the law? So we need somebody who is trusted enough to get that transition. We also have a transition that we must really uh, look into. And this is where we have to have honest conversations about commodities, the patent rights, the, the service delivery model. How are we going to transition if we do not have honest conversation with somebody on the table to support countries to be able to know, for example, how do they consolidate their demand? Do they go for regional consolidation of demand? Do they begin to think about supplies coming down to their own countries through adopting contract manufacturing or local manufacturing? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll now move on to Alexe. Eastern Europe and Central Asia have the fastest growing HIV epidemic in the world. In 2021, 160,000 people were nearly infected with HIV, a 48% increase since 2010. And safe injection practices remain an important factor in the region's epidemic, epidemic and the implementation of social harm reduction measures is highly relevant, but highly sensitive at the same time. You have been working with the field of harm reduction and HIV and viral hepatitis prevention for more than 10 years. How has UNAIDS and its co-sponsors supported your efforts in this field? And closely related to that, can you give us an example of successful joint implementation? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, I got some uh, feedback uh, from uh, my colleagues in the region. So uh, it will be based on the actual examples uh, of uh, what is going on, uh, because as you have rightfully noted, we have the largest uh, and the fastest uh, growing uh, epidemic in the world. So there are a lot of new cases and uh, we need to stop them, period. <laughs> And uh, when talking about uh, the eco region, um, we talk about different countries and uh, very diverse uh, countries. But still, there are examples of how both UNAIDS and co sponsors and PEPFAR and uh, the Global Fund uh, helped civil society in uh, making harm reduction services more accessible to people who use drugs, as well as tackling an issue of uh, criminalization of uh, HIV transmission. So uh, some brief examples of uh, what has been done in the region. In 2018 in Belarus, advocacy from local and national organizations supported by UNAIDS and the WHO led to a partial amendment of Article 157 of the Criminal Code uh, of this Republic. So this article prosecutes condomless sex acts by HIV positive individuals who are aware of their status. The amendment reduced the sentences available and made it possible to retrospectively review the prison sentences of people who had previously been convicted. In December 2020, the government of Belarus announced it was formally considering repealing Article 157 altogether. However, it has not done so until this moment. 
In Russia, that has the largest HIV epidemic in the whole region, UNAIDS facilitated a dialogue between the local civil society organizations and the Global Fund that allowed it to receive a grant for implementing HIV prevention, treatment, and care cascade among key populations from 2021 to 2024. It is one of only a few possibilities to carry out such work in the country, infamous for its intolerance towards people who use drugs and LGBTQI community. Prior to a Russian military aggression in February 2022, Ukraine had made significant progress in HIV prevention among people who use drugs. It includes the expansion of opioid substitution therapy in prisons, transitioning from donor to domestic funding for key populations, and having one of the most sophisticated harm reduction programs in the region overall. However, due to the ongoing military hostilities, this life-saving work made possible with the support of the Global Fund of PEPFAR, of UNAIDS and co-sponsors, is being undermined and further and exacerbated by each new shell, rocket and bullet launched by the aggressor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, I will now invite Joyce. So Joyce, the East and Southern African region accounts for the highest number of people living with HIV globally, including the high HIV incidence and prevalence among adolescents. Women and girls continue to be disproportionately affected by HIV, accounting for 63% of the region's new HIV infections in 2021. These numbers call for further engagement, especially in the area of HIV prevention. You are an advocate for the rights of young people, particularly addressing girls and young women living with HIV, as well as an advocate of HIV and sexual reproductive health integration, especially the latter that is increasingly becoming a politically sensitive topic. In which way does UNAIDS and its co-sponsors support your work in this area? You can go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for that question, Professor. And allow me to start by thanking the organizers for arranging for me to join uh, this session. It's a pity I couldn't join physically, but thanks to technology, I am here uh, with you all in spirit. And I also recognize the privilege uh, that I have to be on this high level panel. And I hope to take full advantage of it on behalf of, of, of the communities that I represent. Um, to answer your question, I won't dwell much on the statistics as we have the experts on this panel, and we all know that the ESSA region has the highest number of people living with HIV and is not doing so great on the HIV prevention, especially among us adolescents and young people, and specifically among us adolescent girls and young women. I always wonder why and how the causes of these scary statistics are known but are not effectively tackled. Why do we choose to look the other way? For instance, young people have called for integrated and adolescent and youth-friendly services for the longest time, but nothing has happened. 2030 is less than a decade away. Um, everybody else seems a little uh, relaxed, except for UNAIDS, who keeps reminding us of our targets and who keeps reminding us of the trajectory we are taking through um, reports such as the In Danger report. But how do we expect to reach our targets if we can't give adolescents and young people the kind of services and commodities that they have explicitly asked for? How can we reach our targets when we do not provide HIV prevention options for young people in all their diversities to make informed choices? Just recently, young women have been advocating over and over that they need the dapivirine vaginal drink, which is the only available long-acting HIV prevention method and is discreet and also promotes autonomy to the young women. Some countries are yet to approve this ring. I wonder why. And partners have refused to finance the rollout of the ring. So I'm wondering how effective and how intentional we are about addressing the issues that are affecting adolescents and young people. How do we expect to meet our targets when services and commodities are not readily available, affordable or accessible for them that need uh, the services at the time? How do we expect to meet these uh, needs and how do we expect to meet our targets when in-country policies and guidelines do not recognize and regard our diversities? How do we expect uh, to reach our targets if we still unconditionally issue funding to countries that criminalize members of the key population? How will they know that we actually mean business? 
it is my understanding that diplomacy up to this level has currently failed as various partners in various countries keep trampling on the rights of people living with HIV, men who have sex with men, sex workers, people who inject drugs and other sexual and gender minorities. Human rights should not be negotiated and neither should they be dictated by people's personal opinion or attitudes. Despite adolescents and young people making up to 0.28% of the new daily infections, we are still not being given adequate opportunities to influence decision-making spaces or to even address these issues. And the inequalities go deeper. However, I have to acknowledge the efforts that have been put in place by different partners who have demonstrated their commitment to supporting and leading the global effort to end AIDS. On this panel, we have uh, some of those who have actually demonstrated the belief in youth leadership and the belief in the communities that are affected and um, disproportionately affected by HIV. We have PEPFA and Global Fund who ensure that resources are mobilized and are provided so that the necessary um, outcomes are realized through effective uh, project implementation. But as Dr. Masha has mentioned, resources are not essential if they're not directed in the right direction. Hence, UNAIDS comes in as a very intentional and instrumental partner in keep, keeping all stakeholders at par with the data at country and regional and global level. UNAIDS has come in severally uh, to initiate hard conversations with our governments who are still fighting and against certain populations, especially the LGBTIQ community, the sex workers, and the men who have sex with men and people who inject drugs. They have intervened with the government and supported the engagement of key populations and partnered with community leaders to make the resources work for us and provide and continue to provide technical support to ensure our engagement is meaningful. UNAIDS has supported the implementation of other donor supported projects on the ground. But one thing that I like about UNAIDS and the fact that I'm even here on this panel today is that UNAIDS has brought, brought us all on board. The global AIDS strategy 2021-2026 and inequalities and AIDS recognizes the depth of inequalities faced by young people in all our diversities and guides us all in the right direction, but only if we are all keen to align. As I conclude, my challenge to UNAIDS, PEPFA and Global Fund is that we, are, we already know where the inequalities stem from and young people know how to stop them. We need to do more to be a little less diplomatic because if we continue to do business as usual, we are still going to continue recording our high numbers and we will keep losing the gains that we have had so far. We need adequate platforms for the ethical and meaningful engagement of young people to support the global response. We need to invest in youth leadership to enable us to effectively also contribute to the global effort to end HIV AIDS and to address the inequalities. And most importantly, to ensure that the resources and the money that we have mobilized works for us. In, in order to make the money work, we need to provide a conducive environment and listen to and invest in the populations that need them the most. Thank you, I submit. Uh, I now invite the second set of speakers and uh, as they respond to the items that I'm going to raise. They are also going to react to any of the comments that have been already highlighted. And um, as we start with Guini by Anima, um, specifically to add AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, we need a place for people living with and affected by HIV at the center of the HIV response. And to reshape the public health uh, policy across sectors and issues. UNAIDS supports countries in reshaping public policy at all levels and provides strategic direction, advocacy, coordination, and technical support. Referring to the insights provided by our previous speakers, please share with us the UNAIDS unique approach to approaching the AIDS response at country level, and what are the best ways to tackle the challenges reported by our three speakers. Thank you. Kenneth, and I'm um, so delighted to be here at the World Health Summit and to be with these distinguished speakers here today. I will be very direct. We issued, UNAIDS issued a report in our annual report in July, this one, and we said that the global response to HIV is in danger. We called it in danger. I recommend that you read this summary of it. Because indeed it is, 
for many reasons, but most recently because of the COVID outbreak, the, the COVID pandemic and its consequences, social and economic, but also because of the war in this region in Europe, in Ukraine, and the resulting crisis, global crisis of food prices rising, energy prices, inflation, all these have pushed us off track to achieve that goal of ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. In too many countries and in many regions, new infections are not decreasing, they are rising. But the good news is that we can change that. We know how to. We know how to get back on track. We've been at it for 25 years as UNAIDS, and we've learned some good lessons of what works. First, we have to do it together. We know that a global pandemic cannot be ended country by country operating on its own. We need global solidarity. That's why we, UNAIDS, we are a partnership. We are not an agency of the UN. We are 11 UN agencies coming together to fight AIDS together, to lead and coordinate a global AIDS response. Each one it's in its own sector, but coming together tightly. So coming together is, is important and we must strengthen that global solidarity. I think Ruth spoke to it powerfully. Governments coming together with communities coming together with the private sector, coming together with various actors to fight together. And we must fight together in different thing, on different things. One, about the money, the aid. Aid money is what is used to help the countries with the highest burden to overcome. So we must come together to raise the money. We must also come together to work on eliminating the debt that is strangling many of those countries. So debt restructuring, debt elimination is important. We must come together to share technology because we need more and more commodities that work for the different groups of people, come together to fight on human rights and so on. So that's one, the solidarity is critical. We must put communities at the center. This is what we do. And I'm so uh, grateful to Joyce who has spoken powerfully to that. So has Ruth and others that communities when they are at the center of responding, that is when we get the best results. Evidence here is so strong. But yet we know that in many of our regions, communities are being pushed back. So again, it is a struggle to put communities at the heart of responses. We call it community-led responses, that communities, those who know best, who are on the ground, who connect with everyone who needs help, when they are leading that response, you get the best answers. And you know, in the countries where the groups that are most at risk are criminalized, LGBTQ, sex workers, people who inject drugs. That is where you really, really need communities to lead because those who are discriminated, those for whom the long arm of the law is looking for, how can they show up in the governmental institution where they're being sought for, if you think about it? But if it is people like themselves delivering service to them, delivering prevention tools, treatment tools, testing them. If it's one of your own first, it's in dignity. You are respected and you feel safe. You're not running away from them. So communities at the center is critical. And we have evidence to show that. That works. And we do that. UNAIDS does that, of pulling communities in. We need to make the money work, as others have said, by supporting the policies, the law reforms that will work. My friend, Peter Sands, who's represented ably here by Diane, will agree with me and will say it several times that the money that is raised for Global Fund cannot achieve its desired impact 
unless the policies and the laws that are needed to create that environment are in place. And that is the work we do at UNAIDS, fighting on law reform and on the right policies to make that money reach where it should reach. We've talked about uh, uh, the data. Again, this is very, one minute left, yes. The, the data is so important here. And this is really a unique example of how to fight pandemics. This is what didn't happen with COVID. For the world to come together and to gather data together in one place so that everyone can use it to fight. This is what we do at UNAIDS. We gather the data. We want to become more and more granular. Today, we are trying to build more data on the inequalities to know who is left behind and why and close the gaps for them. So we gather that data and we make it available. Those are some of the things that work. They are a good example of how to be how to fight a pandemic, any other pandemic would need those key elements I've mentioned and to be prepared for a future pandemic. So what we do is complementary to what Global Fund does, what PEPFAR does. I'm so glad to be sitting and sharing the glory of Dr. John Kenga song. So that is what, that is what we do to help the world to reach the goal of ending AIDS by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie, and for reminding us that we need to do it together. I think it reminds me of an old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. We truly appreciate that, those sentiments. I'm now going to invite Diane Stewart to respond to the next item. We have just heard that the collaboration between UNAIDS and the Global Fund has transformed in many in many ways in which countries are able to approach, fund, and manage major public health challenges posed by HIV and TB epidemics. Nevertheless, grant implementers, especially civil society organizations and community groups require more sustained financing capacity and technical support. Supporting and upgrading community-led responses through more precise costings and financing options will be an important focus to ensure that prevention commodities and programs for key populations addressing girls and young women and activities aimed at reducing structural inequalities and upholding human rights are funded. How is Global Fund supporting this effort? And how are the Global Fund and UNIDS joining forces together? Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and uh, thanks to, to Winnie and to all the panelists for the, for the great discussion so far. Um, I think the, the very creation of the Global Fund was built on the back of the strong HIV movement, as we all know. And that movement brought together activists, community workers, health workers on the front lines uh, across um, Africa and across the world who decided that um, the, the inequities inherent in that HIV AIDS pandemic were unacceptable and that together as a movement, we had to do something about it. Um, and the Global Fund and PEPFAR were created in synchronicity 20 years ago in order to finance that movement. But UNAIDS was the um, organization that helped to channel that money to the front lines and help set the agenda for what we were going to finance. So I think from the beginning of the, of the uh, global AIDS response, we have worked in partnership with different roles and responsibilities, doing different things, um, and in complementarity, I think. But to be more concrete about what we're doing around uh, particularly the challenges facing the HIV response that, that Winnie has, has laid out for us. I think the key elements um, that UNAIDS and the Global Fund work with together are indeed, yes, the financing. The Global Fund has provided financing to countries, um, but we don't do that by writing a blank check. The way in which we, um, we provide the financing is also guided by evidence-based, epidemiologically-based um, interventions and guidance. And so UNAIDS works with us right from the beginning of the process to set the guidelines, to build an evidence base, um, indeed, to collect the data, 
so that every country has enough information about um, what's happening in their countries around the epidemic um, in order to have the right responses. So right from the beginning of the process, UNAIDS is helping us by guiding um, the, the processes and integrating data into the way in which that money is spent. Secondly, um, because the Global Fund does not have presence in any of the countries where we fund, um, UNAIDS's participation on the CCM and working with the government has been really vital uh, for shaping the kinds of responses that we see at the country level. And that, that doesn't take away the country ownership. I think uh, ministries of health um, would be the first to say that they own, they define, they decide what it is they're going to do in their response, but they're guided by the technical help and assistance and support of UNAIDS. The third area where we have really worked together over the last 20 years, and I would say we've doubled down on that um, during the last uh, funding cycle, is on ensuring that community-led responses are at the heart of the response. And this is not always easy. <laughs> as Winnie has laid out and as the other um, speakers ha have explained, um, there can be a lot of human rights related barriers to proper programming at the country level. Um, and money isn't enough to address those barriers. So with our Breaking Down Barriers initiative, what we've done is be very concrete about the kinds of things that need to be funded in order for communities to be at the table. Uh, Joyce mentioned the fact that communities need to include young people and youth groups, and that is also very important. When we say communities at the table, we mean communities in all their diversity, both in terms of the people most affected um, by the epidemic in certain countries, whether that be LGBTQI people, uh, men who have sex with men, sex workers, drug users, um, but also young people who are so vulnerable in their adolescence um, to uh, HIV infections and so on. So all of those people need to be at the table, both in terms of consultations, but also at the decision-making tables, sitting in the country coordinating mechanisms. And we would not have solved those problems. And, and um, I'm, I'm going to age myself, but I was, I was there in 2002 when we started setting up the processes for the Global Fund. Um, and I can really say that it was UNAIDS on the ground who was helping make sure that the right people were involved in defining um, the programming from the beginning and who have helped to address over time obstacles to making sure that all of those voices, those community voices are heard, and that the funding reaches those communities. And, and the technical assistance and support that's necessary for that to happen at the country level can't be underestimated. It's a conversation we have frequently with PEVFAR so that we work together to support the kinds of technical um, platforms needed um, so that even the smallest community organizations can receive funding and effectively program that funding, track and monitor how it's spent, report the data back and be part of the overall response. So we're very proud of the, the 20 years of implementation. You know, to date, the Global Fund has financed more than $24.2 billion worth of investments in HIV AIDS. Um, we provide 30% of all of the international financing for HIV. Um, and we provide um, co-financing uh, on top of that, another $5 billion for HIV and TB co-infection. So that's a huge amount of money. But um, as the title of this session suggests, we don't get outcomes for that money without the wide-ranging collaboration, frequently coordinated um, and aided and supported by, by UNAIDS at the country level. Um, in order to get the, the results and the outcomes. 50 million lives saved so far in the last 20 years. And that's not just um, because of a check that was written. That's because of a wide ranging collaboration, a movement that works to make sure that the most vulnerable people in every country receive the services that they need. Thank you very much, Diane. And for those who probably had questions around Global Fund collaboration with the UNAIDS, I think this has been very well, well, well spoken and said. And I think the other point as we continue, because so that you can also be framing your questions, is about this issue of community-led responses, communities at the center. I think that is a key theme that has come through from all our speakers. I'll now move on to John Kangerson. And specifically to us to say that uh, to date, PEFA is the largest commitment by any nation to address a single disease. 
which is focused on no cost effective on cost effective and accountable and transparent support paper has accelerated progress towards adding aids as a public health threat by 2030 and has focused on reaching the populations most affected by HIV through innovative solutions. So how does PEFA ensure its global priorities are in line with what is needed at country level? And how does PEFA team work with UNAIDS and the Global Fund in order to make the money work? Thank you. Oh, good, thank you. So I think, let, let me perhaps start with the easiest uh, question. The last part, how do, does PEPFAD and work with UNAIDS and, and Global Fund? We work just the way we are seated. So you can see that, <laughs> you can see that I'm in between uh, the Global Fund on, on my left and UNAIDS on, on the right. So I think that is, uh, I've been in my current job now for close to four months and I say that, um, and this is not a political statement, but really an honest reality that the relationship between PEPFAD, Global Fund and UNAID is seamless. I mean, we, we, we talk all the time, we coordinate all the time and uh, really uh, keep all the hotlines open as much as possible. That is helpful because we have to be able to look in the same direction and see the same thing that is ending AIDS by the year 2013. When I just resumed office as the coordinator of PEPFAD, the first question and multiple questions people asked was, what is your vision for, for, for HIV AIDS for PEPFAD? I said, well, I don't have a vision because the vision has been already crafted and endorsed which by all of us as part of the UN AIDS strategic direction that they've given us and we, the commitment we all took uh, to end HIV AIDS by the year 2030. Then it then puts me in a position to rather pivot towards what is the direction that we have to take as PEPFA to get to that, um, that goal. And Winnie and Diana will agree that within a one week of my uh, being on seat, my first trip was in Geneva, mm -hmm. where we, we discussed that I took a look at UNAIDS uh, strategic direction, and we had uh, took part in the board meeting of Global Fund. And when I came back after an intense listening session across the board, we crafted a strategic uh, direction. Just all of that to say that we, we are in sync. Uh, UNAIDS was created 25 years ago. I was around when it was great. It was much uh, sought after. It evolved from the Global AIDS Program, GPA, at WHO, uh, to UNAIDS. And if UNAIDS was, wasn't around now, we all would be calling for the creation of UNAIDS. The HIV AIDS fight is an enterprise. It's an establishment unlike any other disease that we know of, none. I've been around global health for 32 years. I don't know of a single disease that has such an establishment. And the custodian of that enterprise or establishment is UNAIDS. Without UNAIDS, we are lost, all of us. I mean, despite the money, we are completely lost. UNAIDS is the trustee that says that we have to look in that direction I just outlined. And, and go to. So money counts, but that direction also matters. The direction and that peace setter is always uh, uh, UNAIDS. When UNAIDS said a few years ago, the 1990 and the one thing I like with UNAIDS um, communication is, is you think. You don't need to read so long document that is 1990-90, so you go away. Don't, or, uh, the, in danger, they respond in danger. You don't need to read to, to understand that something is in danger. So congratulations, UNAIDS, for being that effective coordinator, that North Star that we all uh, should follow. Now, let me just uh, say a few things about our PEPFAS strategic direction, which is extremely aligned. When we look at the UNAIDS direction and the global fund, we said we just did adjustments within our own direction. One, of course, is the priority populations. We all discuss here, children, adolescent, um, girls and young women, uh, know the gaps, close the gaps. 
and bridge the inequities there. Sustainability, the political sustainability, the PEPFAR will be working with UNAIDS and Global Fund to really re-energize that sustainability. The political sustainability is so important if we have to get to where we have to uh, be. The partnerships, no need to comment on that. Nothing good in humanity is ever achieved without effective partnerships. That means effective coordination. So that people like root in the country are not confused when we come in country and we say, well, this is a direction we don't want the uh, um, uh, global fund or UNA. So I think we are all uh, mindful of that, that effective partnerships. Uh, in doing all of that, we have to remember that systems, health systems or weak health systems are a serious barrier to inequalities or uh, inequities that we discuss here. And of course, bringing down those barriers, both in addressing key populations, which is a third priority population that we are focusing on, uh, LGBTQI, uh, uh, men who have sex with men and others is so important. I will just pose here to caution that none of this will happen in our view without innovation. We have to take the risk, some minimum risk to say that there are certain tools that are available and we need to take those tools up and tease them out. I use this opportunity to address uh, Joyce's comments about uh, options, some uh, prep options that are on the table and funders are not. I think I just want to clear the air here that we are a very strong supporter. We, PEPFA, are a very strong supporter of having those tools that will empower uh, the, the young people. Uh, we just have to go through what I call due diligence. When we met, at the IAS, I want to be very practical. I've met with the community. They raised the issue. I met with them and I said, that is my priority as well. But let me go through due diligence and understand why uh, certain regulatory bodies, including the FDA, have not cleared that. And I've met with the FDA. I've since moved that to the scientific advisory board of the PEPFA to say, examine the scientific merits of this product and advise me. So I'm waiting for that advice. Once the advice is made, we will make a stand. We'll take a stand on that. So Joyce, we are also in a haste. If not, we are probably in a rush than you are to get these products out as much as possible. Long acting prep. We are discussing with Winnie and, and Global Fund on how do we work together, create a co coalition that can really accelerate that and make prevention match treatment so that we are pushing the prevention agenda as well as the treatment agenda so that instead of just reflecting on the 95, 95, 95, we also set some targets and we have fully endorsed the uh, prevention, combination prevention agenda that UNAIDS rolled out at the uh, AIDS conference in, in, in Montreal. So I think in some uh, community leadership you've heard across the board, is a cross-cutting pillar for, 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 for PEPFA. Data leadership is so important. We should know where the virus is uh, and apply resources. The most effective way of applying our resources to know where the burden is of infection. That is why a population survey of so-called fear is so important. We shall be repeating that uh, in many settings so that we have updated data that we share with, with everybody. So I think that the fight, just to conclude, is um, we've made a lot of progress. We should always acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. See where we were 25 years ago, just 20 years ago. Uh, HIV AIDS was scary to all of us. No one, including me, could have believed that we will sit here today and be saying, look, we might as well begin to think of ending HIV AIDS by the year 2030. It is possible. Innovation, scientific breakthroughs, community leadership and a commitment to finish the fight should sustain the response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John, for reminding us an old proverb by Nelson Mandela, which used to say that people believe it's impossible until somebody does it. So that now we are here today, 25 years ago, we wouldn't have believed we would be here today and that you'd be working so well in sync. That is PEPA Global Fund and UNAIDS, and, and we hope this continues. Uh, I'll now invite Peter Wesner to make a statement based on all what you've heard on the key themes that have come across from all the speakers. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, inviting me here. I'm really humbled of being here with, with all the experts and uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really a fan of you, to be to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> because I I know what uh, the Global Fund is doing. I know what UNAIDS is doing, and um, you know probably the best how how I started to work with UNAIDS. This was when we created policies around travel restrictions. This is about 20 years ago. And this was community-led work. The work was paid by Deutsche Aids, and I did it together basically with, with, with me in my office when I studied social work. So we gathered all this data on uh, HIV-related travel restrictions, and we had about 102 countries that would not allow people living with HIV uh, to work in other countries. They would get deported and all of that. So UNAIDS... Uh, took that on board, we gathered the data, we came up with recommendations, and now we have about 48 countries that do that. So this is the work of UNAIDS, to change policy at the ground and to, to make life uh, safer for people living with um, HIV. If I look at the numbers of um, countries that uh, restrict um, freedom for LGBTI communities. I think we have about 79 countries at the moment. I did read the, re the, the newest re report from UNAIDS as well. Um, and to be honest, you know, me as somebody from the LGBTI community, if I would be open in certain countries, then I would be in danger. I, I remind a friend uh, who stayed with me at a conference in Malaysia that was about five years ago. He got drugged and then he got robbed and then he couldn't go to the police because uh, he had invited somebody to have, of course, uh, you know, sex with, with the dating, I guess, apps that you had. And he was he was in danger. He could have been killed without having the chance to do anything against that. So all these laws need to be changed. So, so, so thanks so much for the work that, that UNAIDS is doing. I did hear a lot. I did hear the, the, the word money a lot during the, the conversation. And... I thought to myself, you know, I mean, you, you can only count money that is in the pocket. If there's no money in the pocket, you cannot count that. We just come back from the Global Fund Replenishment. We had extremely exhaustive, exhaustive two months, and you all know that. So my organization, we are doing advocacy work towards the government. Uh, so the Global Fund Replenishment was in the center of our activities. We, are, we were quite happy that at the end we did get 1.3 billion from the German government for the Global Fund, which is a huge step forward to the 1.8 billion that we want as civil society, because this would be the fair share that Germany should pay, 1.8, not 1.3, but anyway, 1.3 is, is a huge amount, so congrats to our government. If I look now um, to the financial situation of UNAIDS, and um, I, have, I have to say, I mean, everybody knows that uh, UNAIDS is underfunded. If I look at the figures, in 2000, 12 UNAIDS had about 213 million uh, US dollars. And last year, there were only 165 US, million US dollars. So this is not a, a lot of, of money. And in order to sort of do the brilliant work that UNAIDS is doing together with the Global Fund, I think it is really extremely important that, the, that UNAIDS is, is supported and funded as well. If I look at German, I'm, I'm German, I'm, my accent, I hope you, you hear it. <laughs> Um, so, so if I look at, at the, the, the German government, every year we have the same fight because UNAIDS doesn't have a budget line in the general public but budget, and often it's forgotten. So every year we have to restart how much money is there in the pocket. Last year it was, it was six million. It has never, the German contribution has ne had never been more than 3% of UNAIDS core budget. And I think this is not... Uh, uh, okay, this should be a uh, change, and, and I really sort of sort of encourage our government to do more for uh, for UNAIDS in order to continue continuously doing that that brilliant work that that has been done and that is going on together, of course, with the Global Fund, with communities, uh, and uh, based on human rights and people-centered approaches and people-centered. Mon people led monitoring as well and what, what, what I, when I started to talk about um, HIV related travel restrictions this is for me one example of of the power of 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 people and community led monitoring because the countries if you ask them and I did get in contact with all the embassies around around the world they would lie to you 
we don't have these restrictions. You know, this is what you would hear. So you need a strong community in order to change that. Thank you. Chair, Chair, can I can I just seek your indulgence? I just want to add to what Peter just said. We need a light moment sometimes. In the middle of the pandemic of the COVID pandemic, I flew into Uganda. Not because I was going on holiday, I'm Ugandan, but because there was an issue. The issue was that gay people, more than 30 gay men, were found in a shelter and arrested. And they were in jail. And the issue, and of course, UNA's response, these are the issues that we always respond to in countries. We are the first responder. And when we took our lawyers there, the issue was that they were accused of, of violating COVID restrictions. <laughs> so now they were in jail. And so I went and I sought a immediately a meeting with the president. In the meeting, we discussed the law itself and why it should be repealed actually. And uh, the president was not in disagreement. He was saying, yeah, this is a colonial law after all. It was brought by the British. We never really had laws against gay people. We, we kind of ignored them and let them be. So I said, so wh why don't we go back to that, Mr. President? He said, yeah, I think we will. Even though we have a law, we can ignore it. I'm not, we are not going to repeal it because we are about to go into elections <laughs> and, and our people, you know them. So, so he said, but what, why are they in a shelter? Why are they in a house together, 30 of them? Why can't they be three or four in a house? <laughs> so I said, Mr. President, because uh, they are running away from families, communities, from people who cannot accept them. That is a shelter. Then he said, so you, Eunice, why don't you make like 10 shelters? So there are five in one house. So, so President, we don't make the shelters. Actually, some kind Ugandan gave them a house to be in. And then, then he said, well, then we must start thinking of how to build more houses for them. So when I saw it going in this direction, I said, Mr. President, but down the road here from State House, there is a house there where they are like 50 women. Why haven't you arrested them? He said, who are those? I said, the nuns. <laughs> uh, he, he laughed so hard. He said, you got me. <laughs> so, but now the, he has kind of practiced the policy of not enforcing the law and we are trying to get him to put it in writing. <laughs> Thank you, Winnie. I think uh, that's very welcome. I think that's a, that's a good addition. And I also now want to welcome any other panelists who would want to react or have something interesting that they would want to share with us at this point before we go to the audience. Anything that you has, has been forgotten? And thank you, Peter, for reminding that, us that we only count the money that is in the pocket. <laughs> I think, I think that, that, was, that, that, was, that was key. Uh, we also have online audience, and I'll be looking at their questions, and I'll probably also turn to the audience. If you have any questions, and as you ask your questions, please target the questions to a specific panelist where possible. And Joyce, you're also welcome to comment. Ooh. Hi, thanks very much. Um, so uh, UNAIDS and the Global Fund and PEPFAR have been uh, made huge advances and shown real leadership when it comes to the integration of mental health into HIV and AIDS responses over recent years. It often feels that where barriers, we spoke about barriers earlier in the Breaking Down Barriers program, um, often this comes with integrating mental health, say, into national aid strategies. And I wondered if you had any advice about how we can work with uh, 
national actors to have what you're uh, integrating into your strategies at a global level reflected within national strategies when it comes to supporting those most vulnerable to mental ill health and vulnerable to HIV AIDS. Sim, are you directing the question to Winnie or to the general uh, panelists? Uh, Winnie, John, Diane, uh, any of any, uh, well, all of you would be welcome. Mm -hmm. All right, to that, but but yes. Sir. Okay, go ahead. So so let let me go first on um, very pertinent question. And when we release our strategy uh, on December first, that is Pepper's strategy. What we released in New York with Winnie. Then and others was a strategic direction, the five pillars. You, it will be very prominent that we will be uh, taking a, a very deliberate focus on how to integrate mental health as part of those uh, underpinnings that we hope can help address other issues of discrimination, gender violence, and, and others. So I think we are looking for, uh, if you have any uh, thoughts on how to effectively integrate those, I mean, please do uh, send send it to me, but we'll be having a consultation. And to the extent that we want to build in indicators that will show that we are making a very deliberate progress in that, in that direction. Um, we believe that it's also important to factor in other things that are affecting the HIV person from the lens of a patient-centered care, like hypertension. How is that? Uh, affecting uh, uh, the population that we've cared for. We, the morality of that is, besides the public health implication, is that uh, you just don't want to save somebody from HIV AIDS and they're on treatment for 20 years, they develop hypertension, and you say, well, uh, that is something, it's not HIV, where the population is aging that we, we supported 25 years ago. We need to factor in that. Mm -hmm. And be partnerships. We don't want to, and uh, on the line, transform PEPFA into a hypertension program mm -hmm. or a men mental health, program. but there are issues that are affecting the, the patient that, uh, patients that we have been supporting. So I think um, be on the watch out for uh, such um, uh, inclusion or elevation of PEPFA platforms to ad begin to address in some of those uh, critical elements in the community, in the context of HIV prevention programs, just so that um, uh, HIV treatment and, and prevention programs, not just a generalized uh, a program. We hope that we can build partnerships, right? effective partnerships that in the clinic, a patient comes in with screen for mental health and for hypertension, we can take care of, of some, but other partners can take care of, uh, uh, extend that sa those services for the long term. Thank you. You are done. Huh? Um, thank you. And yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, it it raises not only the issue of mental health, which I think we've all been grappling with how, how to, to think about um, the pro the right kinds of programming for that, but the wider question of of integration across across the board, which I think jo uh, John is also referring to, which is the um, the real priority that we that we need to to think about going forward. It's certainly a central pillar of the Global Fund's new six year strategy. When we talk about people centered. Um, care and people-centered services, that's what we mean. Um, not, not binary decisions about whether the person is at risk of HIV or, or has HIV, but rather what are the issues affecting this person. And I think there are a few ways in which we're hoping to address this. And, and I would agree with the ambassador that we, we are really open to advice and, and, um, and guidance on this. And I, I know UNAIDS is thinking about this as well in terms of what kinds of technical support are available. But in terms of financing, one of the catalytic funds that we're um, setting up as part of the implementation of the new strategy is around um, community systems and, and community outreach. And I think inherent in that is the idea that we, we support much more integrated approaches, particularly when we're thinking about adolescent girls or adolescents, uh, young women, um, young people generally. Um, where the mental health issues are really quite acute, I think we can all agree, um, that those services need to be much more wraparound services, those psycho psychosocial services, the counseling, all of those kinds of support that we've been offering um, tended to be very focused in it for, for very good reason on, on sexual reproductive health and rights, on comprehensive sexuality education, on those kinds of um, sort of 
baseline interventions that are directed specifically towards HIV um, prevention. But I think we need to widen our concept of what those things mean and what it, what do um, mental health services look like that can support um, a, a full uh, integration of, of issues um, for young people so that they are in control of themselves, in control of their own bodies. Um, and, and there's a huge mental health co co component to that. So I think we, we're looking for ideas about what kinds of things need to be those interventions. And, and the point I made earlier that Joyce had emphasized about having those voices at the table, I think this is also important for the wide range of mental health services, having, having those experts also integrated into the decision-making about the design of programs, the, the kinds of things that are measured in programs will be important for us to be able to find the right kind of, of integration ar ar around the sort of services that can be provided. Thank you, Diana. Yes, please. Yeah. If you have got um, high blood pressure, you can probably even swallow your tablet in public. If you are living with HIV, you're most likely going to hide when you're going to take your tablet. Because of HIV sexually transmitted, and we have a lot of taboos around sex, so discrimination, stigma is strong. Our data does show us that on issues such as retention, staying on treatment, that many times people who drop out have had some mental health issues, some depression about staying on treatment for so long. Think about children. You're a child, you're going to school, and you have this secret that you are living with HIV, the burden that it has on the mind of a child that all of her life she's going to keep this secret about a disease she has that nobody else, or that she'll be frowned upon. So we've known that mental health is a real big issue for people living with HIV. Not to mention people who are just discriminated, gay men, lesbian, transgender, they too suffer discrimination in society and it places a burden on their mental health. But we haven't collected this data. Well, I'm speaking anecdotally. I'm speaking from what we observe, but not with real good data. These are some of the things that we want to become better at. Other people may gather this data for us, but we need to have it and to show and be able to respond. We also used to, sadly, because now resources declining, fewer and fewer people being infected, but we used to provide counseling services to people living with HIV. Once you were tested, it also came with some psycho, psycho social counseling about how to live with this. That is not there anymore. It's treated now as a chronic disease, which it is, and you, you're tested and you go on treatment and there's no support. But the truth is that your life has changed. Once you know you're positive, you know that your life has changed, how you will engage sexually with people, how you will choose a life partner, how you'll go into a job and declare your status, all these things are there for someone to address. So we are not there. I'm agreeing with my colleagues. We are not there yet on mental health, but yet mental well-being is a big part of giving care to people living with HIV or at risk. We are not there yet. We should keep discussing this and finding the answer. Thank you, Winnie. I think the mental health was a key issue also even discussed at the AIDS 2022, and in the issues of integration are, are key. Uh, now, because in the interest of time, this probably will next them will make it longer. They are very interesting things. So, but we will give each of the panelists to highlight one or two minutes key issues that they would want to leave us with based on all the things that we had discussed uh, earlier. But I will start from this end with Alexe. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the region has the fastest growing HIV epidemic in the region and has now been accelerated by the Russia war in Ukraine. 
How do you classify the impact of Russia invasion in Ukraine on the global efforts to aid HIV AIDS, especially in high incidence region? And how do global actors such as UNAIDS and Global Fund support these regional efforts? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. This is a really hard uh, topic to discuss, uh, but I will try. Um, uh, what, uh, what can be done and what has already been done? Um, uh, we would like to thank uh, PEPFAR and Global Fund and UNAIDS and co-sponsors for your unwavering support for our brave peers on the ground. However, when uh, you solve one problem, another one pops up. And uh, currently, we have uh, a lot of requests for ARVs and opioid substitution therapy for refugees in such countries as Poland, Germany, uh, Czech Republic, Spain, Italy, France, to name a few. And it shows that uh, these problems haven't been resolved yet and that a lot has to be done. According to forecasts, up to 500,000 refugees are expected in the winter, in, in the winter period in Poland alone due to the difficult situation in Ukraine in winter. And that is where our efforts should be coordinated and uh, tailored for these specific populations. Also, donor support is essential for civil society and community-led organizations to fulfill their potential in responding to such crises. But donor flexibility in meeting uh, emerging support needs and providing support for sustainability of civil society and community-led organizations will enable a practical and agile response. And as, and as has already been mentioned, uh, mental health uh, concerns not only our beneficiaries, it concerns us as uh, activists, as community-led organizations as well. And uh, we know that due to some political pressure, that due to some donor pressure, and actually a lot of funding comes with uh, its pressure as well. And uh, a lot of grants can be rather bureaucratic. Um, we need support as well, because there is a very high burnout among people who uh, respond to this crisis. And unfortunately, not a lot of donors include this uh, mental health help for activists and for community-led organizations into their prog programmatic activities. And that is and that, that is where a lot should be done uh, to help these people, because uh, we have a lot of uh, turnover of community outreach workers. And uh, a lot of people, they uh, tend to work uh, in their places for a lot of time just because uh, we do not have any new activists coming in because they know that uh, they will deal with, with this burnout and uh, with these issues and with these problems. And of course, uh, as uh, we talk about uh, responding uh, to this crisis, uh, to this ongoing crisis with this war, with this unprovoked war and aggression uh, in Ukraine, uh, we have to think about uh, what the future brings for uh, the ECA region as a whole, because uh, now we have an opportunity to uh, oppose this authoritarianism that is in this region, and we can leverage our activities and support uh, the community-led organizations and help them in uh, bringing more democratic reforms forward even though uh, even through these channels of uh, HIV response, of AIDS response, of substance use response, and of uh, viral hepatitis response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now pass over to Ruth, but Ruth, uh, you have about a minute or two to just summarize something that, that is good for you, that you would want to, to leave us with, and we will go across the table. Yes, uh, and and uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I think for me, um, what is really coming out is that we need to jealously, you know, jealous what people say, guard the fragile gains you've done today. These gains are really um, important for us to reflect on, but I must admit that sitting from the country level, when just more little things shift here and there, you begin to see the danger we have today. And that's why that report is really speaking the truth for me and it's, I have been sitting at the country's driving seat and I know what happens when there's an interruption. The COVID-19 effect will come to us maybe next year, uh, where we're going to probably see what, what it has done to the, the, the HIV um, response. We also have to look at the gaps in a different way. There must be a paradigm shift on how we examine the gaps we have had in the epidemic for a long time. And that's why really I want to congratulate Winnie. Your vision on global inequalities is really what we need to do. 
I lead a response what Joyce was speaking about. When I look at the data, 98 new HIV infections for young people between 10 to 19 adolescents. But then I go deep and dig 20% of the mothers who come to maternities are actually those children. So why do they come to maternities? Where is this unintended, unwanted, and unprotected sex coming from? You go deeper, you dig into the data, and you're going to see 42% of the people who have, or the women who have been sexually violated are the girls. Then again, you dig deeper, who is the violator? You then begin to see the first one is incest, it's a grandfather. Why was the grandfather left with the child? Because there was poverty issues. There was issues of dysfunctional families. There's issues of alcohol and drug abuse, what you're talking about, mental health issues. And therefore, although we have biomedical um, and we have tools we are talking about availing the tools, we still have really structural issues that we must address. And that is the glance you're saying. So we must also go back to the spaces that we've left behind. We must go back to bring the development synergies back to where we are talking about. The minute this girl steps out of school, it means that the whole discussion about empowerment comes to an end. And if we have to end the AIDS epidemic, then we can't leave behind these girls that then are also followed with another mental issue of, of, of a violation that has happened. And they have to live with these people for the rest of their life. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. We'll now go to Peter. Uh, we talked about uh, structural bar barriers, and I would actually add that we have structures that are making people uh, sick and that are unhealthy and that uh, cause uh, mental illnesses. I did prevention work in prison for six years for an NGO in Munich. I know what I'm talking about. I know that the quality of care in prison is never, ever the same than outside. So if we want to end AIDS, we have to look at to the structures that are making us sick. I will be very short here. Thanks. Thank you very much. I will move over to Winnie. You're short and powerful. Um, yeah, two points. I'll talk about the money, that um, global solidarity around HIV and AIDS has been strong, was a great example, 25 years. But we've seen this solidarity weakening. We've seen the resources for this disease declining almost by 60% in the last 10 years. Today, the gap in the whole global response is about $8 billion. For our own little organization, we have a serious financing gap of like $30 million from what we planned this year. So this decline in resources is a serious threat to the response because we must sustain the effort to the end. Uh, we had a good replenishment that showed that actually we can lift ourselves and keep fighting in spite of all the big problems in the world. Germany led, gave 30% more to the global fund than it did last time. So did others, but it's still short of what is needed. So we are here because we want to ramp up global solidarity to keep the response on track. The lives that are at risk are as important as all other lives. The second point is on the human rights. We have to fight and fight and fight. There's a pushback on rights. There's a pushback against people for their who they love or their sexual orientation we still have to fight on those issues and on girls and women in Africa, their rights, their rights to equality. So on those two fronts, if we are to end AIDS, we've got to make more progress. One is political because human rights are really your political rights as a human being. And the other one is solidarity, which is about coming together and working together on a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winnie. We'll move over to John. So, uh, let's protect what works. What has worked for us all on, over the last 25 years uh, or is an institution that gives us their, their compass. 
the programmatic compass or the, prog the uh, uh, pandemic compass, which is UNAIDS. So when I hear that UNAIDS is uh, down by $30 million, my appeal to everyone is let's rally around that and fill that gap so that as we raise, uh, we raise to raise eighteen billion dollars to the global fund. We should not. We should know that this are it's like a hand and a glove. The global fund would not be effective, as we've all heard, without a strategic direction from UN aid. So let's make sure that we rally around and get uh, the UN aid what it needs. Otherwise, we will uh, be terribly uncoordinated in our response against uh, HIV AIDS. It will be it reflect collective failure for all of us. All right, thank you, John. We move over to Diane before we come to Joyce. We're coming to you, Joyce Shorter. So thank you. It's it's hard coming last because all the important things have been said, but I, I'll make just two two comments. Firstly, having spent the entire year uh, working on the global funds replenishment, um, <clears throat> the uh, raising more money for the HIV AIDS response it, is essential, but it's also extremely difficult. So one of the things we have to do both in, in HIV AIDS, but across health um, is really look at the complementarity, the synergy, uh, the partnership with all global health actors. What we don't need is more compartmentalization, more fragmentation, more silos in global health. We need global health to come together. We need to make every single dollar count, every single effort of all of the players across global uh, health work in complementarity um, so that we bring the maximum resources we can possibly bring without duplication, without wasting a cent of the money that we do have available. Secondly, intersectionality. Um, we've talked a lot about that on the panel. Um, when you think of the whole SDG agenda, we have to, in health, work together with other actors. There's climate issues that are going to affect health and HIV AIDS. We've talked about conflict and humanitarian situations. We have to be able to work together, I'm afraid, more and more as the conflicts and the climate crises um, expand around us. So the, the ways in which we can work in synergy and complementarity with our, our partners in education, our partners um, in uh, water and, uh, and climate and environmental protections, all of these things, we, we just have to make the absolute most of everything we have. And so we started with a discussion around the partnerships amongst the people um, on this panel, um, but we have to take that partnership and that collaboration much more broadly if we are to tackle what is really some extremely daunting challenges in fighting HIV AIDS, but more broadly on achieving a, a global health agenda that we all, I think, want to achieve and are committed to achieving. Thank you, Diane. We'll now move over to Joyce uh, to give us a summary. Thank you so much, um, Professor, and thank you so much, everyone. I think a lot has been said, but one thing I'd like to reiterate is that we need to ethically and meaningfully engage young people in spaces where young people issues are being discussed. Um, meaningful youth engagement, uh, while it sounds easy, has proven quite difficult for most partners because the playground is not aligned for young people to engage on various platforms. We mostly engage voluntarily, um, mostly supported by our passion, while everyone else who we are engaging with at the table has either allowances, build cars, or is very effectively supported. We barely have feedback mechanisms amongst ourselves as meaningful involvement requires resources, and hence we look like most of the times we are actually not engaging but we have come a long way um, to go uh, we have come a long way and we still have a long way to go when it comes to engaging young people in all the diversity just recently um, young people living with HIV led by the global network of young people living with HIV came together to develop the WIMATA values guidelines which is a set of guidelines that aim to guide uh, organizations on the meaningful and ethical engagement of young people in the HIV response so this is a guide that will enable all, all um, institutions and all stakeholders as to actually know how and what meaningful and ethical engagement looks like. Um, I'd also just like to say that it is time to not only call out, but to call in governments to support the HIV response. We need everyone else on board. And I think uh, from the example that Dr. Winnie has shared that uh, the government's actually willing to have these very difficult conversations, but in a nice way, in a way that they can actually understand. And another thing I'd like to say that uh, has been reiterated over and over again is that we need to decriminalize key populations and provide a conducive environment for existence. I cannot 
not emphasize that enough. And finally, we know the gaps. Let us close the gaps. Investing in youth and community leadership is the way to go as we are ready for equal partnership to commit and to contribute to the response. Thank you. And back to you. Bro. Thank you, Joyce, for the powerful finish. Um, as we come to the end. And I invite Paul, but before I invite Paul, just to apologize to the online audience, they sent some questions. We'll find a way to direct them to the appropriate people. And I also believe our excellent panelists will be around for some time. So if you need further discussions, please engage them in person. And now invite Paul to give the closing. Well, thank you, um, Kenneth. Thank you very much. And first of all, Right, what an amazing and inspiring session. Thank you to all of us, um, to all of you, actually, not us, um, that you've talked about. I heard words like effective partnership, the importance of data, leadership, solidarity, but also resources and fragmentation, duplication. A lot is here to be mentioned. I would like to thank all of you for your contributions that you made in so many regards to this session. I think it became clear that this session has really highlighted very clearly the roles of different actors in the HIV response and the importance that we need to work together and join efforts if we are serious about ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. I know a lot of questions remained unanswered, but I also know that we're working good in a very collaborative fashion all together. And I would like at this time to take the opportunity to thank all speakers of this panel starting with um, Dr. Laibon Masha, Alexei Lakov, Joyce Wama, Winnie Vianmina, Diane Stewart, and Dr. John Enken Gazong, as well as Peter Wiesner for all of their contributions today to make this today a really truly remarkable and exciting session. Also, thank you to you, Kenneth, for your excellent moderation and also for your contributions and interest and for being with us here today. Thank you very much and have a wonderful Walter Summit. Thank you.